Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar today. My name is Georgina Manuk. I'm the Assistant Director for Research and Assessment at Brown University Square Center, the administrative and research home of the Carnegie Community Engagement Classification. I am joined today by my colleague, John Saltmarsh. John, I'll let you introduce yourself. Great. Thanks, Georgina. Um, so I'm John Saltmarsh. I'm a uh, visiting scholar at the Square Center. Uh, I also teach at the University of Massachusetts in Boston in the higher ed program. Um, and I want to thank Georgina and the Square Center for hosting this webinar. We had, uh, I think, close to 60 people with us last week. I think we'll have more than that today. So obviously, it's good timing to uh, have this kind of Q&A around the Carnegie classification. Thank you, John. Um, so our conversation today will address preparations for both first-time applicants and campuses that are reclassifying, that's campuses that were classified in 2010, and will include an orientation to both the classification and reclassification frameworks, an overview of the 2020 timeline, some strategies that have been effective for successful applicants, and we'll go through a quick overview of the online portal. Um, some technical information before we begin, because of the number of participants in the webinar, you will all be muted. And starting now, please put any questions you have using the Q&A function. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, uh, there's a little box that says Q&A. Um, if you click on that, you can add any questions you may be interested in us answering uh, there. You can also add questions anonymously if you wish. Um, just a note on any questions you might add that reference a specific question. We highly encourage you to add that question in its entirety so that we um, know exactly what you're referencing. And if you can say whether that's whether you're classifying or reclassifying, just to give us a sense of which classification you're uh, referring to. The webinar will be recorded, and so has our previous webinars. Um, if you go to our website at brown.edu slash square slash Carnegie slash resources, you will find previous recordings, and we will make sure to add this, um, this webinar to that list as well. So in terms of the cycle timeline for 2020, uh, we made the announcement about the process in January 2018. In May, we started um, making, we made the online portal available and anyone could um, request access to that application. Um, April 15, 2019 is the application deadline in the portal. Um, and December 2019 is when the review process will be concluded and campuses will be notified. January 2020 is the month where we will be making a public announcement about classifying campuses. John? Okay, so we start this um, always with uh, focusing in on, Carnegie, on the Carnegie Foundation's definition of community engagement. Um, and the reason for that is that um, this is a classification, an institutional classification around community engagement with a very specific definition, uh, which is around characteristics of engagement that include reciprocity, um, mutuality. Um, it's an asset-based framework focusing on co-creation of knowledge. Um, and that's really critical to the entire classification framework. And we say that because um, there are lots of really good activities that go on uh, on campuses that have some connection to uh, communities outside the campus, but they may not fit the definition that Carnegie uses. Uh, for example, there may, might be very good experiential opportunities on the campus uh, for opportunities for experiential learning that don't fit this. There might be really good development opportunities on the campus, but they don't fit the definition. And so it's a, it's a classification around the way that Carnegie claims community engagement, there's two parts to it. One is the process, and then the next slide um, is the purpose of engagement. Um, to strengthen democratic values and civic responsibility, address critical issues that contribute to the public good. So just keep that in mind as you go into the application that Carnegie needs something very specific. You may use the term community engagement on your campus but it may not fit this definition, and this is really critical. Um, okay, so the next slide, we just provide this 
if it's helpful as you're thinking about putting together your application and you're gathering evidence that there are multiple dimensions to institutional community engagement. Um, some of those are related to the mission and purpose on the campus and that's in the foundational indicators. Um, some of them are related to improving teaching and learning. Those are in the curriculum engagement part. Um, some of them are around uh, the new production of knowledge. Um, and those uh, are questions around faculty scholarship. Um, and then there's questions around partnerships um, connecting to the community. We provide this simply because in order to get the classification, you need evidence in all of these areas. It's not going to be enough to have them in, say, one or not in others. So again, just as you're putting together your application, thinking institutionally, making sure that you've got evidence in all these different areas will likely lead to a successful application. So what you're trying to do as a first time applicant is to put your best case of evidence forward and make your best uh, and tell your best story. Um, and we've recently for this 2020 framework added two questions around context uh, to start off the application with words that you want to use to describe and facts that you want to highlight to describe the history and context of your own campus and your own community so that reviewers understand your answers within that context. All narrative responses are limited to 500 words. So, and for first time applicants, you, you would not use links to web pages um, because the reviewers will not be going through them. Um, you will be using, and, and you'll be using that space in, the, in your response anyway. So you want to use the 500 words strategically and um, really make the best case for your campus. Make sure you're aligning different units and not focusing on just one um, example of community engagement on your campus. For reclassifying uh, institutions, the framework is designed for an evidence-based reflective process focusing on what has changed. So the real message you're trying to show is what has changed since receiving the classification. And the framework is seeking evidence on how community engagement has become deeper, more pervasive, better integrated, and sustained. And it's important to note here that the focus is on depth and quality within a sustainable institutional context and not on greater quantity. So we're not necessarily looking for more partnerships or more programs. What we're looking for is, what, what the reviewers are looking for is, is showing how you've changed, how you've made your commitments more sustainable and how you're adding depth and pervasiveness to your, uh, to your community engagement across campus units. The framework is structured to include narrative responses, allowing for explanations of these changes that have occurred since the previous classification. And they're designed to address what currently exists, changes since the last classification, and relevant supporting evidence. Wherever requested for reclassification, you can provide links to relevant campus web resources and evidence provided in the application. Um, reviewers may want to examine websites, so any reference to or some of that evidence existing on your online portals would be helpful. And they may also ask for a telephone conversation to clarify evidence provided. The review process will be anytime between April and December. So we don't really have a specific time. I've, I know I've been asked that question around when might reviewers ask those questions, but they will be answer, asking them of the email that you have provided. So just make sure if you have any contact changes uh, after you've submitted the application to reach out to us and update that information. In general, it's important to remember some effective approaches from successful applicants and keep, keep in mind an institutional perspective. A lot of this work happens through across institutional teams. You might be a small group writing it, but you might be collaborating with a lot of different units on campus. So make sure you highlight everyone's story on your campus and not just your own center or the main coordinating body for this work. If you've given a lot of examples from your medical school, if you have one, maybe even if they're doing great work, maybe you want to switch to some other examples from other units to show that other parts of campus are doing great work as well. And most importantly, don't leave blanks. If you, if you can, answer all the questions. Um, and it's important here to just note the, the difference between two, two ways of answering questions. So, if you don't have some, if the answer is no to something, first of all, we've added an optional question in the online portal for you to share any input you'd like to say about that. So it's an optional box if you want to clarify your answer. So like, 
in Brown's case, we are going to say no, that we do not have community engagement in general education because we do not have general education requirements. So if I say no to that, I can actually sh share why, why that's, if there's any context that will make it helpful for the reviewers to why my answer is no. But there's also like hope to as a way of answering questions. So we don't have it, but we hope to have it, which the review committee will not really take into account. But that's also different from saying we have, we don't have it and we're working on concrete plans to have it. And we've, I don't know, formed a committee that is charged with doing one, two, three towards these next specific next steps. So whenever you can, if you don't have something in place, you, you, you want to share concrete steps towards taking it and commitments from leadership towards taking these next steps. John? That's great. Thanks, Georgina. Um, so I want to just sort of switch the perspective here slightly. Um, and this is more to think about what this looks like from a reviewer's perspective. Um, and again, that's to help you in terms of putting together your applications. So one thing to keep in mind is that reviewers think about this as a holistic review, um, meaning that there's not any one part of the, the application that's either gonna make or break a successful application. Um, there's not one set, which is actually a set of questions that are actually sort of critical compared to the others. It's taken as a whole. Um, and so what that means, going back to what Georgina said, is if you don't, have evidence in a particular question that doesn't mean you can't be successful because that's going to be taken in the context of, of the whole of your application. Um, another thing to keep in mind is there, are, there is a section on the application called foundational indicators. Those are considered to be foundational. Um, it's, those are the indicators around um, how an institution as a whole has a commitment to community engagement. If you don't have evidence in many of those, it's really hard then to sort of have the kind of larger institutional engagement. So those foundational indicators are ones that you want to pay attention to. But again, if you don't have evidence in all of them, it doesn't mean you're going to be successful. Um, and then the other thing that reviewers look for is a coherent narrative. Um, and so just think about that as you're putting together your application. Um, does it tell a coherent story? And that may mean the process with which you put together the application, you might want to have one or two people do the sort of the final writing and make sure that there's sort of a coherent voice throughout it and that it's telling a coherent story. Um, you don't want sort of one story at one part and one story at another part and they, they're not really matching up. Which goes to another thing that reviewers look for is alignment. They're looking across the application and they want to look for evidence that's consistent across the application. So for example, you know, campus might say, you know, uh, we're a community engaged campus. It's sort of built into the DNA. You've probably all heard that before. It's part of the mission of the institution. And the evidence is that it really is part of the mission of the institution. But then when the reviewer gets to the question around strategic planning, and community engagement isn't anywhere in the strategic plan or listed as a strategic priority, then the reviewer is sort of asking this question about alignment. How does that work? You have a mission where you're completely committed to this, but it's not part of your strategic plan. And then there's sort of a scrutiny of the application. Do things match up here? Do they really um, align across the application? So you should just be thinking about that too. Um, and then related to what um, Georgina said earlier is this question around implementation. And reviewers are gonna be looking at this for what's been implemented, not for what's been aspired to. And in every cycle, we'll get at least a few applications where the campus will talk about all the things that they plan to do. Um, and that's great. And if they actually do all those things, they'll probably be in good shape for the next cycle. But you don't get classified for what you hope to do. You get classified for what you've been, what, what's been implemented. Um, so again, just keep that in mind. Thanks, John. So for those of you who haven't yet um, navigated the online portal, I will just very quickly walk you through the process. If you go to brown.edu slash square slash Carnegie, you click on the 2020 classification 
on the left bar that will take you to the application information and in the timeline there is an access link to the online portal. You can select whether you're a first time or reclassification, increase the quantity to one and add some credit card information there and you will receive a confirmation email um, from notification at giftboss.com. So if you, this might land in your spam, so I would double check that before reaching out. Um, it might just be in your spam folder. This will also, as you can see here, this is what it would say. It will say your name, congratulations, you just made the purchase, and it will give you the link to start the application. So this is the link you want to save moving forward to be able to access the application or the receipt you want to go back to with this information. And then this is what, we should yes. just let them know too. If for some reason you you say paid for this months ago and you can't find the link, just let us know and we'll we'll get it to you. Definitely. Yes. Thanks, John. Um, so this is what it looks like on the online portal. There is a horizontal menu and a vertical menu that are uh, that are very similar. Um, you can add you can look at, you can see, you see the overview, the contact, the different sections, permissions, collaborators, and, um, and the submit application. As you can see, there's a little picture of me next to, next to it, and it will remain with you as you scroll down. And so you can click on contact and email us at any time with any questions or any, anything you need us to troubleshoot. Um, for contact, there will be title, institution, and more information. We already have your name from when you filled out the payment, so that's why there's no name here. This is all the questions, the first few questions about campus and community context. As you see, there's a word, uh, there's a box, and there's a word counter under it that's telling you the word limit, and there's five words in the box, so it will, it will count five. So as you're writing, this is counting, and if you're cutting and pasting things into the words, um, the words, the text box, um, you just want to make sure that the last word went through and that your your word count is consistent with what you have. The other, the rest of the questions, a lot of the questions are yes, no questions. So if you click yes, it will pop, it will show you the follow up question. If you click no, as I mentioned earlier, it will show you an optional box that says please use this space if you wish to explain your answer. And again, this is optional. You do not have to use it. These are some other examples of questions you will see. So this is the to the left is questions that are asking about numbers or percentages. So you can either navigate the arrows or input the number directly. And for some of the check check the boxes questions, you will have to check the box before the box will appear. So um, if you just do that, just check the ones that are relevant to you. And for each, you'll provide examples in the box. For the community partner question, for those of you who are familiar with the community partnership grid, we've switched that into um, an easier process so that you can add partners now. And when you click add partner, you'll get a pop-up that will show you some questions. If you have a pop-up blocker, make sure you unblock it for this website. And then you'll include the title and information about the partnership. Each one of the, these questions is also 500 words. Any um, any box with, with text is 500 words. And then once you add partners, you have the option of removing or editing and viewing details um, on the right side here where you could see actions. For if you wish to share this portal access with others, just note that they will have editing access. We will work towards adding different permission levels for future cycles, but right now if you add collaborator, you are prompted to add their first last name and email that will send them an, that will send them an email um, and they will be able to log in and like sign up for an account log in and be part of your collaboration team uh, for writing the application and again you can navigate that with actions and remove a person um, as you need it. You can download the PDF at any moment. Uh, we're working on improving the format of how that downloads, because right now it's, it will download better if there's more information in the, in the text. Any questions? I will mention that every single box has a 500 word limit. There's only one question that will have, that will remove the words 
count for, and it is the letter of support from your president or provost as part of the reclassification. So this is not relevant to the first time applicants. Reclassifying campuses have to share a, a letter. We're adding an upload button so that you can actually share a PDF of a letter or cut and paste that into the box and it can be more than 500 if that's how you've drafted it. So again, please use the Q&A function to add any questions and John and I are going to start to answer them. Uh, John, do you, have, do you want to add anything else before we head over to the Q&A? No, this is great. So we'll start working through those, but if you have other questions, just add them into the Q&A tab. Great. So regarding fundraising versus external funding, what do you all see as the difference between those two things? So the main questions here are, is external funding dedicated to supporting institutional engagement with community? And is fundraising directed to community engagement? John, do you want to take this one? Sure. So think about fundraising in the sense of, do you have activities going on that are specifically raising funds to support the community engagement work that you're doing? Um, that could be through your Office of Advancement, finding individual donors, seeking out grants. So that's funding that's coming in to support the work. The external funding is, are you investing resources from the campus into the community? That can mean all sorts of different things. Right? It could mean that the campus takes part of its endowment and invests it into community development work. It could mean that one of the partner sites, um, given the work that's doing in, in the partnership, uh, there's a need for computers at that site in the community and the university donates computers that it's no longer using to that site, investing essentially its resources into the community. So it can mean lots of different things, but it's funding that's going out, not funding that's coming in. Great, should we notify community partners that they will receive a letter and a survey from Carnegie? Sure, please do. The main reason we shared the questions with you is for you to communicate with your partners and like let them know they're receiving a survey. Feel free to send the survey question to them. This is our first attempt at trying to pilot a way where community partners have a formal voice in this process. Uh, I know some campuses have community partnership representation on their own internal Carnegie committees. Some involve community partners in other ways through other um, bodies of, of governance or engagement that they have. Uh, we definitely encourage you to notify campuses. And another note to mention here, the moment you add a partner's contact information, they will automatically receive the survey. So if you just be mindful about if you want to give a partner a heads up or just leave it till the end and add that information in the end. Do the reviewers receive the three optional questions at the end? Reviewers will receive all the questions that you answer in the survey and we definitely encourage you to answer the optional questions in the end that are asking you to reflect on the process, to reflect on any questions you didn't have a lot of space for and uh, to reflect on um, any additional things that you weren't asked. So your input on that process will be the first thing we look at as we design the 2025 framework. So we definitely encourage you uh, to give that information there. And we will, we're looking to have, um, we're committing to have more spaces where you can provide input on the classification process in the interim years between the cycles. When are you, when you are counting courses, is it correct to count various sections of a course in addition to the course itself? Um, so the answer would be yes, but also make it clear that that's what's being counted so the reviewer knows that that's the case. Great. After entering the partner information at the end of the application, we can no longer see our narrative. We cannot see it on the download either. How can we access this portion of the application for review and editing? So your partner information, as I showed in the previous slide, there's, a, there's an edit information or remove partner. And that's where you'll, uh, you'll see that information for editing purposes. I'll look into the ability to download that in addition to, um, to the rest of the application and make that visible there. We are reclassifying. When will the survey be sent to the list of partners we provide you? So the moment we provi you provide us with an email 
for each partner is when the survey will be sent out. Right. So that's actually a, just a really important thing to think about, right? So if you enter that information, say today, then the partner will get it probably tomorrow, today or tomorrow. Mm -hmm. If you don't fill in that information until you actually submit the application and you submit it the last possible moment in, on April 15th, then that's when they'll get it. Um, so just think about that when you're entering the community partner contact information. Mm -hmm. Great. My, my questions has to do with budget questions for first-time applicants. On questions 2, E3, three, and 4, which is the ones we just mentioned, uh, what is the difference between external funding dedicated to supporting community engagement and fundraising goals focused on community engagement? Am I discussing the actual use of funds? And in question 4 on fundraising, I am talking about strategy and goals, not the actual funds raised. John, is there anything else you want to add on this specific topic? No, I, I think we addressed I think that. We just, For some we just reason, answered that. That the person feels like we, we didn't address it, then let us know. Great. We have a large medical center separate from our academic division. However, it is governed by the same board of trustees. Should we include them in the application or is it optional? So that's a good question. And there's not one right answer to that. I would approach it in a way that if the medical center is engaged in activities around community engagement that contribute to the kind of evidence that you want to put forward, then yes, include it. Um, and I can think of multiple examples, examples where that's the case. However, if the medical center operates quite independently from the rest of the campus, and I can think of examples of that as well, and doesn't really have the same kinds of community engagement strategic priorities as the rest of the campus, then I would provide that as part of the context at the very beginning to explain why the medical school isn't being included. Um, so there's not a right or wrong answer to that. Think about how it either goes back to what Georgina was saying about making your best case. Does including it help you make your best case or does it actually hurt making the best case? And just explain the context. Great, thanks, John. This question has to do with section 2G8 on college level policies for rewarding scholarly work. And questions like this that have an 8.1, 8.2, 8.3, does the 500 word limit apply to all the questions within 8? No, every single sub question has its own 500 words. The same is the case for things that say check the box if this is relevant and give examples. This is also for each check box, you will get a 500 word limit. First time applicant, do we have 500 words for each of the 15 examples or 500 words total for all the examples? 500 words for each of the community partnership examples, which I'm assuming is what you're referring to. When in the calendar, sorry, when in the calendar year will community partners be contacted to complete the survey? And I think we answered that. When well, the moment you include their email on the survey, uh, on the application. First time applicants, we have community partners without email addresses. Can they be contacted for the purpose of follow-up survey by some other mechanisms than email? At this stage, we do not have the capacity to be doing any phone interviews. If you really feel like that's a partnership you want to highlight, then we would recommend in the space where it says email to just share that this partner does not have a, does not use email. Uh, we're hoping to, this is the first time we're piloting input from community partners and we're looking forward to learning about all the, all what's working and all the challenges that we can anticipate for future cycles. When do you anticipate the surveys? That was just answered. How should we add multiple links? So. In the reclassification framework, the, there are some follow-up questions that say provide link here. If you, use, if you need to add more than one link, you can use the 500 word text box and if each link will take one word out of your um, total word count. We are applying for a new classification. At the end of the application, it seems there is an opportunity to go beyond the 500 word response. If we extend our response into this area, is that a good idea or not? Optional, use the space to elaborate on any questions. Please specify the corresponding section item number. Um, I believe every question has a 500 word text box. So 
I wouldn't extend your response beyond that. But I think the question- You can double check. I was reading the question a little bit differently, Georgina, in terms of whether mm -hmm. uh, applicants should uh, essentially take those open areas seriously um, in terms of providing evidence. So if that oh, was sure. the question, then I would say yes, absolutely. Um, uh, use those spaces as an opportunity to provide any other evidence that you think a reviewer needs to know in order to really understand community engagement on your campus. Yep. We have some areas of weaknesses or challenges and wonder how honest we should be in addressing them. A scandal a virtue? I will say yes and send it to John for more feedback. I would just say absolutely. Uh, yeah. Again, from the reviewer's perspective, they want to they want to be reading an application that um, that comes across as authentic. And uh, there are very few campuses that have a completely rosy story. Um, so it's better to just be uh, completely candid about what's happening on your campus. And I think that's true for both the first time in the reclass. And I say that specifically around the reclass because over a 10 year period, the likelihood that everything went exactly as you planned in a very linear process um, is pretty unlikely. And, uh, and so reviewers don't really expect that, but they do ex expect a narrative to talk about through the ups and downs and challenges, hear that, how, how those challenges were approached, here's how things shifted, and here's the trajectory that we're now on. Um, that would be a much more authentic story. Yep. So we have some, but not all colleges who are rewarding faculty for engaged teaching and scholarship. How do we answer the questions toward the end of the forum that ask about this as an institutional commitment? Our university is very decentralized and colleges work very independently. I think you say exactly that. Our universe, if, if you have a specific context to why this is not an institutional level commitment, then you share your own context around how, how centralized or decentralized your institution is and you provide where it says are there institutional level um, faculty and like reward systems for um, faculty tenure and promotion around community engagement. If there's no institutional level policies, there are specific questions around departmental level and it seems like that's what you have. So you can just share um, the different colleges that have that embedded in their process. John, is there anything you want to add here? Um, just that there are specific questions around colleges and departments and it asks around numbers. Um, mm -hmm. So to say some doesn't really help. Um, so you need to just be clear about how many you're talking about. Because if it's two out of eight is very different than it's six out of eight colleges. Yep. Right? Um, or if it's you know 10 out of 54 departments is different than 40 out of 54 departments. So just make sure there's enough context there that a reviewer can actually understand what's going on. Great. Can we use bullets and numbers in responses? You can use numbers, but there will not be indentation. So that's my answer. We are applying for initial classification. I wondered what, what, what happens if community partners do not log in to complete their portion of the application. They receive an email, but what if they do not respond to the survey? Is there a timeline for them to complete their portion? Is there a number that needs to complete information? Can enter up to 15 as I understand it. Correct. So you enter up to 15 that you want to highlight. You include their contact information. In the cases where they have an email, we will send them an email. And you will not be penalized if your partners do not answer this question. Again, we are piloting receiving community input, like direct input from community partners for this cycle. And we hope that a good portion of your partners will have access to. Uh, to the survey and for those who have access to it that they will fill it out and back to the first question that we were asked around whether you should tell your partners that there's a survey we are confident that engaging partners early on in the process um, telling them more about what you're doing with Carnegie if you haven't yet and sharing the survey and the utility of why answering that is helpful will get more more partners to be engaged and to answer that survey would you recommend that we give you some stories about student experiences or do we just want to know what we are doing? So 
Um, I would say that it probably depends on which question you're talking about, but um, think about using the stories as a way to uh, illustrate the what. So you don't want it as a substitute for the what you're doing, but if you say, here's what we're doing, and here, here's a, an example based on a student experience, that would help the reviewer um, really understand sort of the, the the full depth of what's going on. But I wouldn't just sort of put the story there as a way of substituting for an explanation of the what. I think about this particularly, say, in the question around student impacts. Um, so what reviewers are looking for is that you actually gather systematic data around, uh, around the impact that community engagement has on students, and you can provide really good data on that. Um, but it wouldn't hurt there to also have a story which illustrates the data. Um, it just allows the reviewer to understand it in a different way. Um, so I hope that helps. Yep. On the chart of engaged courses offered, do we, do we count multiple sections of the same course as multiple classes or just one? I.e. if we have six sections of one course, should it be listed as one course offering or six? So John recently answered that question. Whatever you do, just let us know how you're counting them. Does this, does this make sense, John? Yeah, yeah, we, we covered that. Okay. Um, I'm not sure you saw it. Okay, answer that, done. Question about the president's letter. We have a two-page letter signed by the president, just like I saw in other submissions. The online platform does not let us upload. So it will let you upload. If it's not yet, it should be up this week, um, we're adding an upload button and the word limit for that question will be removed. For the explanation section following a no answer, are those also 500 words maximum? Correct. From your answer, thanks for answering my question regarding external funds and fundraising. From your answer, external funding was explained more like Section five on the institution investing its resources. If we confuse the question and list items in one when they belong in another, will it be held against us? Uh, no. Can you provide more context to this question? Do the business operations of the campus as an anchor institution align with local economic and community development agendas through hiring, purchasing, and procurement? Uh, so this is a question which is really thinking about alignment across the institution. So you're doing community engagement in the academic work of the institution, in teaching and learning, in research and service. You're doing community engagement in student affairs around student development. But does it hit other parts of the institution not necessarily connected to the academic core? Um, is it part of how the campus does hiring? Um, and recruitment for staff? Is it part of how the campus uh, thinks about buying from local vendors? Um, those are the, the pieces which are more around uh, the campus's economic relationships with the local community. Those are really and can be very important complements to the core academic work of the institution. So the question just there is, is this happening on the campus? And if it is, what does it look like? Yep. I'm assuming you can save and return to the application. Is that right? So the application should save automatically after you input answers. If you're having any, if you're having any issues with the save feature, please let us know. Under faculty roles and rewards, are the 5.5 to 5.9 narratives meant to be an alternative to posting URLs and descriptive text for 5.5? It seems like the answers would be the same. Let me quickly. Look at five and five five over here. So these are not like there's slight differences in these, but they're quite specific. So one is asking for specific links to current policies that describe how community engaged approaches are conceptualized and evaluated in faculty tenure and promotion. And then there's a specific question in 5.6 around 
college, school, or department level policies. And 5.7 is listing them. And then 5.8 is calculating the percentage of total colleges that are represented by this list. And with, um, with nine, you're citing examples taken directly from those policies. So that's, there's a, there's a, if, you, if you read the questions carefully, there's some nuances there that you will be able to find. I have a follow-up that might help clarifying the funding question. There are two questions related to external funding. One asks about external budgetary allocations dedicated to supporting institutional engagement, and the other asks about investment of financial resources externally in the community for the purposes of community engagement and community development. Your answer, your answer regarding external funding seems to relate more to the second question, so I'm wondering about the distinction between these two questions. Yeah, so I'm, I don't have it in front of me, and uh, it's sounding to me like there might be some redundancy, but I need to look at those. So we'll do that after this and, and make sure that it's clear. But um, yeah, I, I don't, I'd have to look at it. Mm -hmm. Based on these conversations, we are not ready for the 2020 cycle. When will the next application cycle occur? So for the next application cycle we will announce it in 2023 it will be due mid 2024 and you will be notified by the end of 2024 and the public notification will be in 2025 so if you, okay go ahead um, if you've already started working on your classification or already paid to access the portal we also recommend that you actually submit it and get feedback from the reviewers. You'll have the opportunity to, to hear from the reviewers on specific recommendations that could make you even more ready for the 2025. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. So I think this is important for everybody. Um, so you submit an application um, and you're not successful. So just keep in mind that uh, Carnegie doesn't release any information about campuses that aren't successful. So you're in no way going to be sort of punished for putting in an application that wasn't successful. However, if you are not successful, you will get an email um, from us uh, inviting you to have a conversation with a reviewer um, to get specific feedback on your application. And what we found in the past was that this was enormously helpful to campuses. Uh, and that in many cases it led to a successful application in the next cycle. So just keep that in mind. If you don't submit, then obviously you're not going to get that invitation and there won't be anything to get feedback on. Um, so just sort of weigh that in your calculations about whether or not you should submit. Um, you may sort of end this, this sort of process saying, you know, there's no way that we're going to be successful. Um, but there still might be a benefit to turning in your application. Mm -hmm. Can you provide what you are looking for in this question? If yes, indicate the focus of these systematic campus-wide assessment mechanisms and describe one key finding for both institutional outcomes and impact. Let me try to find that question. So any institutional assessment question that is asking for systematic assessment mechanisms is asking about what are systems that you have in place for collecting, analyzing data, information related to the different things that it's asking you about, in this case, institutional outcomes and impacts. And then for every series of those questions, it's asking you, how do you collect that information? Who collects it? How frequently? And then what do you do with the with the results that you find. So it's really going through the whole cycle of, the whole life cycle of assessment. Uh, and in this specific case, it's asking you about institutional outcomes and impact. So if you said that yes, that you had systematic campus-wide assessment mechanisms to, um, to design uh, input for institutional outcomes and impact, it's asking you to indicate the focus of these as assessment tools and then describe one finding. So what did you find from this information that you've systematically been collecting 
about specifically in institutional impacts and outcomes. So you would have already in a previous question described what those mechanisms are. And in this specific follow-up question, you're giving examples and descriptions of findings from the results of what you found. Once partners receive the partnership survey, how long do they have to complete and return it? So we we'll hope to give partners enough time, maybe a month or two to be responding to the survey, but we'll hopefully get their input by the time reviewers start reviewing your application. So if you send them the survey ahead of the deadline, you'll have more, that'll give them more time to be able to answer the survey question. On question A 1.4, it asks for how many departments are represented by those courses. What do you mean by departments? We have eight schools and departments in the school and programs in the department. Then we have non-academic departments. Do you only mean departments in the schools? Right. Yes. Academic departments. Correct. Yeah. Um, Georgina, I just want to go back yeah. to the previous question too, um, just because mm -hmm. it often comes up. So the question had that language of systematic assessment in it. Yeah. Um, and you you talked about it, but I just want to remind everyone that you'll see throughout the application that the language is always around systematic assessment. Um, and what Carnegie means by that is, do you have systems in place for gathering data? Um, and the difference would be whether or not say to put together a Carnegie application, you scramble all over the place to be able to find the data that's needed, but that's not having a system in place. Um, and so just think about those sort of systems. It may be that, and this happens, that we'll get feedback that going through the process of the application made us recognize, no, we don't have systems in place. And so our plan is to put those systems in place here, here, and here, because we know that we need that on an ongoing basis. Um, but that's what Carnegie means when it talks about systematic assessment. Yep. First time applicant, I'm using abbreviations after I fully name an organization or unit. An example, Center for Global Initiative, CGEI. Do you want a separate list of acronyms to make it easier if someone forgets and doesn't want to search through the document? So that's fine. I would, if you're, if it's like, if the Center for Education Initiative is something that the main center and you're citing it a lot, then that's fine. But if you've used one question, one acronym in the first question and you're following up on something in, towards the end of the application, then you, you want to write the whole name. I mean, reviewers can go back and forth, but I mean, it is the same reviewer that's going to be reading your whole application. So you can make some assumption about their knowledge of it. Or I mean, I'd say things like abbreviations of your institutional name, are fine, a key center on your campus, that's fine. But if you're using all the, if you, especially if you have space in your word count, I would just use the full word. Is it possible to list more than one contact for a community partner? So right now it has one space for adding email. If you feel like it's helpful, you can use some of the other fields to add that information. Um, and we can send them the, the email too. Question about the president's letter. We have two page letter. Yes, that, that is all set. And we will add an upload button. Would you prefer to the comments? If a college has multiple touch points with one partner, should we focus on the deepest institutional connection or highlight the breadth of the opportunities for engagement, which may include episodic and or co-curricular initiatives? So I think in, in terms of how you describe that partnership, you say exactly that. This, we have multiple touch points with this partner. The deepest institutional connection is X program. But at the same time, we have all these other um, curricular or co-curricular initiatives that are happening. So it's important to tell us that you have multiple touch points with that partner. And even if they're at different levels of depth. Can you elaborate on how to distinguish between experiential learning and community-engaged learning? Okay, so um, this often comes up and uh, the key here is that you on a campus are able to make those distinctions. So experiential learning might be a cooperative education experience. 
it might be a required internship. Um, oftentimes those are designed to develop the professional capacities of the student um, and not so much uh, to meet needs in a community or at a community site. Oftentimes there really isn't a community partner um, and the relationships are often much more transactional. So um, what reviewers like to see in an application is where there's a clear statement about we understand the difference between say a clinical experience um, and community engagement and here's how we define them and we're only counting those experiences which meet the definition of community engagement on the campus. Then the reviewer knows exactly what the numbers mean and what they stand for and what the examples um, relate to. So uh, it's just really important for you to make that distinction. Um, if you want a resource for that, uh, a good place to go is a book that was done by Marshall Welsh on in, called Engaging Communities. And, uh, and in that, he has a nice section uh, in that actually a, a graph which makes a distinction between experiential um, education and community-engaged learning. Uh, there are other resources too, but that's uh, one that is, uh, I find to be really clear in terms of helping to make that distinction. So we have a community partner based in the Dominican Republic and they may prefer to respond to a survey in Spanish. Is this, is this an option for survey distribution? So right now we do not have the capacity to translate the survey questions. That's definitely feedback that we'll take into account for next round. Um, so they will be receiving the survey questions in Spanish. If you wish to translate those questions or you have that capacity internally, then, then that might be an alternative. But right now we're sending surveys out in English. For reclassification, will reviewers be comparing the application to the initial application? How much context should we be providing in our answers on the reclassification for, for reviewers? For questions that include as evidence provided for your earlier classification you described? Um, typically, reviewers won't be pulling out your old application. Um, what they're looking for is that you've done that and that you are providing a kind of a comparative narrative. Here's what we did last time. Here's what we're doing now. Because it asks for that. Um, I think it would be unlikely for a reviewer to go back and pull out the old application. Um, and I say that in part because uh, if I were doing a review and I, and I found that I needed that application to be able to make sense out of the reclassification, um, uh, that would be a problem. Uh, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't have to do that. Um, and I would, I would be, uh, I'd be hesitant to sort of go back and sort of pull out the old one and do the kind of comparative work that the application should be doing itself. Yep. We are struggling with providing evidence for everything in our narrative. We have a culture on campus to purchase from regional companies. I can't find this written down anywhere and I suspect it's due to our very restrictive straight regulations regarding purchasing. What do we do in a case like this, for example? So you just shared that you have a culture on campus to do that. This can be a sentence like, while we do not have any written policies due to the restrictive state regulations, we do have a culture of purchasing from regional companies. So I, anything that you're struggling to write because of a specific context, it's really important to share that context with the reviewers. Um, John, do you want to add yeah, anything here? Yeah, I would add, George, yeah, just in terms of what this person wrote, it would be nice to then follow it up, and here's an example of what we mean by purchasing mm -hmm. from a regional company. Yep. Just, uh, just help the reviewer understand sort of what this actually looks like on the campus. Yep, great. If we only have one policy, the faculty handbook, and can cite three examples, will that be a problem? Uh, I guess I'm reading that to me, one policy meaning- uh, The tenure and promotion. There's really nothing else below that. Yeah. Right. Um, so this would be a campus that has institution-wide policies, no school-wide policies, no department policies, just the institution-wide. Um, then just explain that, which is why you can provide three, three examples. Mm -hmm. 
Are you going to post a response to the distinction regarding the external funding question? So I think we, we covered that already. If you want to follow up with any questions, just let us know or we're happy to follow up on email. Please explain this question further. In the context of your institution's engagement, support services and goals, indicate which of the following services and opportunities are provided by checking the appropriate boxes. Employment status, professional staff, professional development programs. So this is a table that has some different opportunities for professional development for staff and faculty and has, I think if I'm not mistaken, on the vertical axis, the employment status, so by employment type. Um, so this is asking if there is support to, the, to facilitate partnerships offered to these types of um, staff of, the, of this employment status. If you offer student teaching assistance to these uh, to these staff or faculty by which employment status. So do, do non-tenure track part-time faculty have access to student teaching assistance, for example. So you're just kind of filling out that grid. Uh, planning or design stipends. So if you're designing a new course, for example, or program, do you offer stipends to faculty or staff by each employment status? Support for student transportation. If a Part-time faculty member has a community engagement as part of a course that they're teaching. Do you offer support for student transportation from and to the community partner? Eligibility for institutional awards. Are institutional awards related to community engagement? Would, would a part-time faculty be eligible for those awards? Or would a staff member be eligible for those awards? Inclusion of community engagement and evaluation criteria. As you evaluate, um, staff or faculty from different employment statuses is, is community engagement part of their criteria. Participation on campus councils or committees related to community engagement. Are professional staff, tenure or tenure track staff part of um, these committees? And the same thing for research conference or travel support. Do you offer these services to this, these types of faculty or staff by which employment status. We have examples of engaged faculty scholarship with some of the same faculty mentioned more than once. Should we aim for five different faculty for these examples? Uh, I would say yes. Because um, uh, again, think of it from the reviewer's point of view. If you look at this and there's five examples and it looks like only one or two faculty are the ones that are contributing to the community engaged scholarship, it raises the question of how widespread it is. If you can provide five different examples showing different faculty um, and probably from different disciplinary areas, to areas depending on the content of the scholarship, that would, that that's a, goes back to making your best case. Because then the reviewer, looks at that and can understand, well, this is actually spread you know, beyond just one or two faculty. Yeah. So just to be mindful of the time, it is one o'clock. John and I will continue answering those questions. So if you have to leave, we will add the recording to our website. So just wanted to make sure to mention that for folks who have other commitments at once. Will campuses receive requests for clarification and then be allowed to provide additional content? Uh, the request, be, uh, like an email request, will if there's, so it'll be around having a conversation to clarify um, things that reviewers don't quite understand. Um, out of that conversation, potentially a reviewer could ask for more information or more content, uh, uh, but I think it's unlikely. Will successful applications receive feedback? So this is the first time we've, we're moving the review process to a full online process. So we're hoping through that to be able to streamline the process of creating reports for feedback for campuses who are unsuccessful. Um, but as we do that, we will be able to also assess whether it would be feasible to provide feedback for campuses who are successful as well. John, do you have anything else to add here? 
Yeah, we just say, but it, it, I'm going to sort of add to what you said, which is, but at this point, we're not making a commitment to doing that. Correct. Um, so yes. What we've done, what we've done in the past cycles, is provide all the successful campuses and the unsuccessful ones with uh, sort of an overall assessment of uh, of the reviewers' uh, look at the applications. So this time there were four different areas where clearly there were challenges and we encourage campuses to attend to those as they move forward. Um, and uh, I, I, my thinking is we'll do the same thing this time. Um, and while we'd like to be able to have sort of individual reports for every campus, we just don't have at this point the capacity to do that. We're, we're hoping that we can do that in the future. We might be able to pull it off this time, but we're not committing to it. Do partners have to complete the survey before the April 15 deadline? No, we're hoping to have more flexibility with the partner survey, but if they can do that, that would be great. So as you can share that ahead of time, that would be helpful. We are considering whether or not to pay a consultant to provide feedback on our application. Is it a good idea to do that? If we do, should we indicate that we have paid a third party consultant to review the application? Um, I don't know that there's a right or wrong answer to that. Um, if you think a third party, um, sort of independent set of eyes uh, on your application will help you. Um, and I'm thinking about what help you means here, help you with a successful application or help you understand your work better. It helps you understand your work better Then, by all means do it. If uh, hiring that person really has helped you to um, advance the work on the campus, um, then I think including that in some way, maybe in the last sections, in terms of why you thought that was important to do it and what came out of it, that certainly would be helpful. But again, I don't think there's um, a right or wrong either to having somebody do that or to sharing that information. It really depends on, it's up to you whether you want to do that or not. Where do application reviewers come from? What types of individuals review applications? Are they external to the Carnegie Foundation and to the center at Brown? or is this only an internal review process? In other words, is this handled like an NEH grant review panel where multiple reviewers are involved and discuss an application? So it's not like NIH, um, and we do have a group of reviewers, they're called the National Advisory Committee. Um, they're all listed on the, uh, the Carnegie website at SWEAR. I think we have 16 of them now. Um, the way the process works is that there are what we call core reviewers, where uh, they read all of the applications. Um, how many core reviewers there are depends on how many applications we get. So I can tell you the way it worked last time, there were four core reviewers that read all of the applications. And then uh, the larger body, the National Advisory Committee, is brought in around applications where the core reviewers feel like they need uh, uh, different perspectives on what they're looking at to uh, just get a better understanding of whether the uh, campus is actually sort of meeting the criteria of the Carnegie classification. And so it's after that process then that the determination is made about whether a campus is successful or not. Um, it'll look something like that again this year, but again, there may be more than four core reviewers if we have more applications than we got last time. So uh, exactly the number, I don't know what that looks like, but they will, the core reviewers actually are, come out of the National Advisory Committee, so they're out of that list that's on the SWEAR website. So for Section 3C13, faculty, staff, scholarship examples, may we include examples prior to academic year 2017, 2018, or are these limited to recent scholarships only? No, absolutely. You can re you can have it earlier. Um, that's fine, and uh, the dates will be apparent by the date of the publication. Mm -hmm. Will reviewers be interested in knowing more about our self study process? Um, it, I think that depends, right? Um, f yes, um, in general, we're certainly interested in your self study process. Um, 
I can tell you what I'd be really interested in as a reviewer is in sharing that self-study process that it became clear that as part of the committee that was involved, it, uh, it brought in community partners, it brought in student voices, and that they were part of the core committee. That tells me something about reciprocity, and it tells me something about how student leadership is valued on the campus. Um, I'll give you an example. At, at Weber State University in Ogden, Utah, when they reclassified in the last cycle, um, there was a city councilor that was part of the core, the core team putting together the application. Um, as a reviewer, to me, that says, wow, that's really interesting that you've got those kinds of relationships in your community, that there's that kind of commitment um, to, the, uh, to the application and to community engagement generally. So it, it, it depends. Um, I think, again, generally we're interested in what you did, but um, depending on what that process looks like, it might actually provide more evidence to the application. Answering the community partnership question 3B21, we are repeating some partnerships that were included in our last classification. We think this shows longevity of the partnerships. Any comment on repeating versus new partnerships? Uh, no, it depends completely on the context and I would agree with you, it does indicate longevity, which is largely a good thing. Um, yeah, depend, you know, things shift on campuses. We got uh, this question at one of the workshops we did where Campus said, you know, uh, we used to have, I'm just making it up here, like 50 partnerships and we, now we only have 25, but we've been really deliberate in limiting the number of partners so that we can go deeper with those so we can have a greater impact. And so they were saying, you know, is that going to hurt us that we have less than we did before? And the answer was, of course not. It's actually going to help you be, because you've provided a rationale for why you're doing that. Um, so you know, it's just making it clear sort of why it is that you have the partnerships that you have and, and how it helps you do the work better. And having a long-term partner can certainly help, help, help you have greater impact in that community. Just a curious question for those interested in contributing to the process in the future, how does one become a reviewer? So we're committing to, we where got became the, the administrative and research home for the Carnegie is around two years ago now and we've been really really focused on putting the classification out there adding the new framework and making sure the process is running smoothly so we're looking forward to making much clearer and more transparent processes about all of these review process what goes through the review how do you become a reviewer in the in the coming months and to make sure that 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 information is accessible to everyone John, do you want to share anything else about this question? Uh, no, it's been sort of a, an evolving process that started in 2005 at the Carnegie Foundation where Amy Driscoll brought in some national experts to sort of help with that process and that got added on to. Um, it got expanded when it was uh, shifted to the New England Resource Center for Higher Education um, and then expanded further um, when it went to Brown. Um, and uh, we're planning on sort of you know, evolving this further in a way where there are processes for people to say, I'd really like to be a reviewer and there'll be criteria around sort of what that would mean, but those haven't been developed yet. Um, how many applications did you get last time? Um, so I, I don't have the exact number on the top of my head, but I can tell you uh, approximately uh, so for first time classifications, we had approximately 150. And I can say that because I know from looking at multiple cycles, that's pretty typical. We get about 150 brand new applications. I don't like using that number, partly because then people use it as kind of uh, comparing that to the number that actually got the classification and call that a success rate. Um, the reality is, again, over multiple cycles, about twice as many campuses request the application then actually turn it in. And so there's a, a large self-selection process going on um, at the same time that there's sort of the review process going on. Um, so we're expecting um, somewhere in the vicinity of 150 new applications this year. Um, uh, it could well be more than that. Uh, I suspect it won't be less. 
um, and there'll be a, probably a similar to the past almost double that number that start the application but then don't turn it in. Um, so that's sort of what we're anticipating. Is it okay to list things from this current academic year when we are talking about concrete plans to do things in the future? Absolutely. So the main distinction about data from which year and what time is specifically about academic year data. So when you're talking about course information, for example, April of this year, April of 2019, is not the end of this academic year. So the last academic year where we have a full year of data is 1718. Um, so that's that's where that's where the guidance around academic information specifies. We were we're asking you for data from 1718. If you have plans that you've set up this year, if there's institutional priorities that became even more concretized through this year's academic year, if there is an internal survey that you run or an external survey from the field that you've administered in the last few months or even this month, feel free to use all of that information in the application. And any information that you use, just make sure you clarify where it's coming from. If you don't have enough space, use the last space in the and the space in the last section to reflect on that. You have already answered a version of this question, but I just want to be sure I understand internal funding versus external funding versus fundraising. Internal funding is institutional funding for community engagement. External funding are grants or other funding sources for community engagement. Fundraising is development work specifically tied to community engagement. Is this correct? Yeah, so again, we're we're going to go back and just make sure, I'm going to go back and make sure that there's not redundancy in this, but we, what we're trying to find out is um, internal um, versus external funding. Uh, another way to think of that is operational versus soft money, right? So, and clearly what reviewers are looking for there is that the community engagement work is built into the operational budgets and it's not just sort of um, going along on soft money where the you know, the funding runs out and then the program goes away. Um, and then in addition to that, there's the question of, um, is there investment going on with money that is university money being invested in the community? Um, so there's multiple dimensions to this. And, um, and again, I'll go back and just make sure that there's not redundancy in the way that that's asked. Mm -hmm. So, that's it. I have thank you very much for your time and insight. Thank you. Will this PowerPoint be shared with us? And if the questions were answered live, will the document be updated to contain the responses for our reference? So the recording of this whole conversation will be shared with you. So you will have, and like I made sure to read all the answers. Um, so you actually have them um, in the recording. I will make sure to have it on our website in a few days. and. In the follow-up email that you will receive after attending this webinar, you will have the link to the page where we have the recordings. We already have the previous recording, so feel free to watch that and see if there's anything helpful there. And we will be adding this one, which will include the PowerPoint slides uh, very shortly. So thank you all for your great questions. If you have any additional questions, feel free to reach us through the portal or at carnegie at brown.edu. Uh, as I said, we will make sure to post this recording on our Carnegie resource page shortly. Um, thank you, John, for joining me today, and have a great day, everyone. Thank you, Georgina. Thanks. Bye.